Hi, welcome, I'm Gemma and stay focused because this week's case is not obvious. It involves a woman who is in the middle of settling her divorce when she goes missing. But how can a cockapoo help solve this mystery? Let's get straight into it. This is the case of Laurence May. <laughs> On the 28th of November 2007, in a little village called Farbus with a population of 500 people, a call comes into the police from a man named John Zableski who is in sheer panic. His girlfriend is missing. Laurence May, 36 years old, hasn't come home yet. He has desperately been trying to get hold of her since she went out for a walk with her dog Chloe the Cockapoo in the afternoon. Now the worst thing is that Chloe has just been found 5 miles away from their house alone with no sign of Laurence. Laurence left her bag and her phone in the house when she went out for a walk with the dog so there is no way to get hold of her. And so what has happened to her? Maybe she had an accident or maybe it's something worse. And so the police begin a preliminary search of the area that very evening. The police know that the first 24 hours of a disappearance are critical if they want to find the person alive. The first evening they find nothing so the next morning, they set up police checkpoints to stop any traffic and ask them if they have seen Lawrence or anything suspicious. They bring in helicopters, sniffer dogs, they begin a search of any wooded areas and roadsides. They go from door to door in an attempt to find out if the neighbours know anything and ask her close friends and colleagues if they know anything. They discover that on the 27th of November, Lawrence was feeling unwell. She had left work and had gone straight to the doctor to get a prescription for a severe upset stomach. And the following morning, still feeling awful, she sends a message to her co-worker Sylvie, asking her to inform their boss that she won't be coming in that day. John Zabaleski states that he also also stayed off work on the 28th of November to look after Laurence. Since she didn't manage to get all of her prescription medicine the day before, he goes out at around 4pm to get the rest. When he goes out, she sends him a message asking him to please not forget the medicine, telling him that she's going to take the dog for a walk, that she loves him and that she thinks they should begin a family. After John collects the medicine, he hits the gym and comes home at around 6pm. When he arrives, he discovers a letter that shocks him. There is a note stuck to the garage door with tape saying that Chloe the cockapoo had been found and she was safe, with details of who to contact to get her back. Chloe had been found in Bois Bernard without Laurence. So John calls the people who found Chloe to ask if they seen his girlfriend at all, but they tell him that the dog was alone. He tries calling Laurence, but hears the phone ringing in the house and ultimately finds out that she's left her phone in her bag there. Where is Laurence? So at 7pm, only one hour after he has arrived home, he calls the police. Laurence and John had met one year ago at the gym. They were both married at the time, but John had separated from his wife and was going through a divorce. And when he met Laurence, he whined her and dined her, lavishing her with gifts and champagne. With him, she felt like she was living her best life. And she was sold on this new and exciting lifestyle. And so soon after, she asks for a divorce from her husband. On the evening of her disappearance, she was supposed to attend a meeting with her husband and her lawyer. The meeting was to discuss the division of assets, including the biggest, their house. John is trying everything to find her, printing hundreds of missing persons posters, trying to organize searches and even getting the press involved in the hope of encouraging anyone with any information to come forward. At one point in desperation, he even goes to a clairvoyant to try and get more information. Who claims that Laurence is still alive but is struggling to breathe and is somewhere near a big tree? John goes straight to the police with this information, but they are skeptical to believe information from clairvoyance. So then he tells the police about the meeting that Lawrence was supposed to have with her ex-husband and the lawyers to come to an agreement on the sale of the house. The very evening that she disappeared. And now that she's gone, that means, guess what? Now that house is 100% her husband's. That to me sounds like a pretty strong motive. So the police directly check out the husband's alibi. He works in a bank and on the 28th of November, he didn't leave his office at all. And there are a bunch of witnesses confirming that. Could he be working with someone? 
So how many leads do the detectives actually have in this case so far? Since the beginning of the affair, there are a couple facts that just don't sit well with France's finest officers working on the case. First, they have a problem with the cockapoo. When Chloe was found, she was completely clean with her collar and lead still on. Almost too clean. This dog has allegedly walked for five miles in October. The ground is extremely muddy and there are twigs and leaves everywhere. And she would have had to walk through long stretches of countryside to get where she was found. And it's a poodle cross. And if you have ever had a poodle, comment below because you will know exactly what I'm talking about when we say that everything get stuck in their fur. Now I'm thinking about it, they could literally be the inspiration for Velcro. But somehow there isn't a drop of muck on her. It would appear that she has been planted there. But why? Secondly, the SMS that Laurence sent to her co-worker Sylvie was strange for three reasons. One, it started with Bonjour Sylvie. Hello Sylvie. Whereas actually when they looked closer, every time Laurence sent Sylvie a message, she always said Bonjour ma poulette. And secondly, when she asked Sylvie if she could tell their boss that she would be absent that day, she said Je serai absent. The correct way for a woman would be je serai absente with an E at the end, pronouncing the T. Je serai absente. And three, the fact that she asked Sylvie to tell their boss that she wouldn't be there was weird in itself. She had a good relationship with their boss. She more likely would have just told him herself. Was this message really written by Laurence? The police don't think so. They know that the only person who had access to her phone, which they recovered on the night of her disappearance from the house, was John. Beginning the 4th of December, the police assign undercover detectives to watch every one of John's movements 24 hours a day. And they are about to witness something shocking. Now is the moment to take the plunge and subscribe if you haven't already. Every time somebody hits that subscribe button, a fairy is born. I'm obviously kidding, but it does make us feel really, really happy. Thank you. Back to the story. So the undercover team discreetly tail him as he heads across town to a jewellery store. They watch him go in and patiently wait. And when he leaves, unbeknownst to him, a police officer slips in behind him, flashes his badge and asks the jeweller what he was doing there. The jeweller informs him that John had come in to exchange two rings for money. He shows the officer the two rings, small, delicate, and relatively feminine. The jeweler had exchanged the rings for 40 euros in cash. John has just sold his missing girlfriend's rings. What? Selling the rings of the woman he was crazy about. This is enough for the police to get a warrant and do a thorough search of his house. They use blue lights and meticulously sweep every single inch of the house. And they find that hidden on the un Underneath side of the mattress is blood, Laurence's blood. John is driven straight to the police station for an intense interrogation. And after hours of pressure and powerful interrogation techniques, John finally says, okay, I can't take it anymore. I can't hide this any longer. Laurence is dead and I buried her. Laurence is dead. He alleges that when he came home, he found her dead on the bed. Trigger warning here, so please be cautious if you have sensitivities. John states that Laurence had tied a steel wire cable around her neck and committed suicide. So why didn't he tell the police? Why did he create a crazy story and waste hours and hours of everyone's time? He claims he was in a state of panic. So he thought the best thing to do was send fake messages to himself and her colleagues, then to dress her in fitness gear and drive her out to the forest to bury her, then dispose of the steel wire cable that she had used as a weapon against herself in a nearby canal, then drive out to a neighborhood five miles away and drop off the cockapoo so that his story made sense. Well, that's one way to think about it. The police don't buy it, and either do you, probably, and actually, either do I. John is immediately incarcerated where he awaits the trial. So who is John Zableski? He used to be in the military, but when he had his first son in his first marriage, he decided to leave. So he became a salesman where he would gain a reputation for being a bit of a hustler. On his business cards, he stated that he was the owner of the business that he worked for, which was not true. 
and he was living it large, always buying bottles of champagne and driving flashy cars. But did he really have the income to support this lifestyle? Well, simultaneously, he was dabbling in dealing narcotics on a kind of casual scale. And once his first job didn't work out, he moved to another company, but relatively soon after he was fired. The thing about this is he didn't tell Laurence. In fact, every day he pretended that he was going out to work in the morning. Where the autopsy of Laurence matches John's description of what had happened is she did in fact have a cord around her neck, but there is no way she could have tightened it with such force and the marks on her body indicate that she had definitely not hung herself. And on top of that, there are lacerations on her head, which does explain the blood on the mattress, but which she could definitely not have given herself. This suggests that there was a struggle. One month after John's incarceration, an anonymous letter arrives to John's lawyers, stating that John is definitely not guilty. No, 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 it was definitely Lawrence's ex-husband and demanding that they do their work properly and put the real murderer in jail. The letter is written in all block capital letters to hide the identity of the author and is riddled with spelling mistakes. Two weeks later, another letter arrives, this time with a hand-drawn map stating the exact location of where a box of Laurence's jewellery has been buried. It's near a small bridge and a canal, the same canal in which John claims to have disposed of the steel wire cord. So they spend hours searching the area with metal detectors but by nothing. They also recheck every single detail about Laurence's ex-husband, profiling him and looking into his friends, his colleagues, every one of his text messages, his phone calls. But they exhaust all leads and there is nothing indicating that he had anything to do with Laurence's murder. A huge amount of time and resources has been used to follow through on the instructions given in the anonymous letter and eventually with some extensive digging they discover that John in fact has a notepad in his cell with the exact same paper that was used to write the letters. And when they analyse this exact notepad, they discover that there are light impressions of the exact words written in the letters. Although John vehemently denies writing the letters, the evidence is clear. So John brings up a new and far-fetched theory. Once again, he claims that he did definitely not kill Laurence. And this time he blames it on the Mafia. This time he is ready to tell the truth, the whole truth about what happened to Laurence. He had agreed to work with the Mafia, in particular a certain Marcelo. They had worked on a small contract together, but when the deal fell through, a couple of gangsters showed up at his house and murdered Laurence. Then they instructed him to dress her, bury her, call the police and tell them that she is missing. So the whole affair had been orchestrated by the Mafia. This guy... <laughs> to everyone's surprise, in the trial he actually pleaded guilty and he finally tells the actual truth or at least we think so. Lawrence had found out about the fact that he was unemployed and she wanted to leave him. Well, he couldn't handle the idea of her leaving him and in a fit of rage, he lashed out. And after lie upon lie upon lie, everyone is somewhat relieved to finally hear the truth. He is given 30 years in prison with a further 20 years parole, which is actually quite a lot for a one-time murderer, but his devious character and constant lies and epic ability to waste police time played a big role in the sentencing. So our thoughts and prayers are with Laurence Mai's family. Rest in peace, Laurence, you deserved better. Thank you so much for watching. If you have made it this far, first, you're awesome. Secondly, if you need more, then feel free to click on these videos. Click the notification bell if you want to know when we release a new video so you make sure that you don't miss anything. Like, comment, subscribe, and most importantly, take care of yourself. Merci les amis, à la prochaine, bisous.